Hello, beautiful community. You're very welcome to this microscopic masterclass about how to follow experts. But in the process, we genuinely are going to together read Tim Snyder's latest article in the New York Times, to which some of you have asked me to react. But in the process, while we will um, work through what Tim is saying and look what might be the problem with it, this isn't going to be so much a piece about Tim as it going to be about what it means for you to negotiate the informational environment in one specific respect, which, which is how to relate to the experts you follow. And here is the um, takeaway that we're going to land on. Um, you all too often think in terms of a debate between this perspective and that perspective, and you have um, a lot of commentators online using expressions like battles of ideas and reasonable discussion between opposing points of view. Now, that is how most people who read books, who are sophisticated and want to think about the world, react to um, expert commentary they consume, or just commentary. That's a mistake. The key distinction is not about um, which judgments are right. It's about which enterprise the person expressing the opinion is engaging in. What are they doing, right? How are they communicating? Why are they communicating as they are? For whom are they doing what they're doing? What are their goals, right? And we're going to look in, in a little bit of detail uh, about how that looks. You know, is somebody um, just an academic expressing a view? Are they a public intellectual? Is what they say especially designed for a general audience, right? Um, where exactly do they fall in that spectrum? Are there other distinctions beyond just intellectual and public intellectual, right? Are there ethical distinctions there too between doing this decently and doing it indecently? We'll look at all of that. So that's going to be our methodological sort of conclusion. Um, about Tim, our conclusion is going to be that at the moment, um, his recent interventions are sufficient to indicate that he should be considered not an historian and a a public intellectual, but an historian and an activist. So, um, the piece we're going to look at is uh, was originally called um, "We Forgot Nuclear Powers uh, Have Lost Wars." We forget that nuclear powers have lost wars, um, and then the NYT changed the title to "Putin is Fighting and Losing His Last War." Now, we're going to skip only the first couple of sentences of Tim's piece because he does an introduction there um, uh, where he mentions um, the Soviet intervention in Afghanistan and he says that, you know, during that time and during Putin's brutal invasion of Ukraine, we've been understandably worried about nuclear war. So let's go with Tim's piece and we'll stop and uh, make comments but the um, point is we're not trying to zing Tim, we'll zing him a bit. Um, the point is we're trying to categorize him and in the process of categorizing we're trying to make sense of how to make sense of um, you know, what experts do and um, how we um, benefit from their contributions or their interventions right? by understanding properly what exactly it is they're doing which kind of game it is that they're playing. Well, let me actually just give a bit of, bit of context because um, um, Tim has got into trouble with the academic community on several occasions recently where a, a large number of academics internationally have been uncomfortable with his public interventions. And my own view, as you'll find out later, is that I tend to be a bit softer on him, actually. Um, but he got into trouble recently for arguing that the way folks were being selected into the Russian army had the eugenics component to it because folks were coming from diff different ethnic regions and experts came in and they argued that these different regions of Russia are still predominantly ethnically Russian and that the, the intentions um, of the Kremlin give no evidence that they're doing it. A second 
um, time, he sort of indirectly got in trouble with our co conversation here, actually, is around Ivan Ilyin, because I've never criticized Tim's uh, commentary for this, but um, Tim's um, connection of Ilyin and Putin is too tight, it's too close, in, in my opinion. Tim has also got into a little bit of trouble for um, his um, arguments about the place of Russian literature in understanding Russian imperialism. And around this, I've been asked to criticize him a bit, and I haven't done a reaction video on this, actually. Um, but um, Tim's remarks along the lines of how um, 19th century Russian literature needs to be reevaluated in terms of what folks outside of Russia, what folks who are victims of Russian imperialism have to say about it. These comments have been heavily um, criticized um, for misunderstanding 19th century Russian literature because it's enormously progressive and anarchist and anti-authoritarian. Um, but actually, I think, if anything, the main criticism on that should be that it's a misunderstanding of literature as such to link it to Putin. I mean, these criticisms have indeed even come from Ukraine and the Ukrainian public um, intellectual Andre Baumeister has even criticized parts of Tim's lectures, which I very highly recommend on Ukraine, um, which you can find on YouTube. Um, for um, sliding over into um, advocacy rather than um, truthful historical narrative. So there's a progression of controversies. Um, and we'll see if this is one or not. So we'll read this together. Let's go. Um, Today's Russia issues an unending stream, Tim says, of nuclear threats. Now, Tim's busy. So don't think that, you know, to write this New York Times piece that he, you know, spent weeks and weeks doing it. So um, you, you can't think of every sentence he has being nailed on. You can't be that critical. Um, in the West today, Tim goes on to say, um, unlike during the Cold War, these are discussed in psychological rather than strategic terms, Russia's nuclear threats. Um, how does Mr. Putin feel? How do we feel? Americans' fear of escalation, Tim goes on, um, delayed the supply of weapons that could have allowed Ukraine to win last year. Now, I think that even if that's an exaggeration, I think that's a, um, a, a point that I support. Um, I do think that fear of escalation stopped us from doing more more quickly, and I think that could have put Ukraine in a better position and um, not my argument, but a consequence, an implication of other arguments I've made suggest that that would be in our national interest too. Weapon systems deemed escalatory, Tim says, have now been delivered with no negative consequences. And so again, when I'm making these comments as I go through Tim's piece together with you, um, think of this as commentary on sort of um, what it is that is happening here rather than what particular point is right, right? So think think of it as us looking sideways at the piece rather than just weighing whether um, each sentence is correct. And I think that uh, that's absolutely correct and there's been a kind of a, you know, a, um, a toe-in-the-door situation whereby um, with each new escalatory level of support for Ukraine, which has got our toe in the door, waited a bit, got the second toe, the third toe, and then uh, the, the, you know, the, the foot has come through, um, as today's news uh, indeed confirms about um, Britain giving weapons of, of, of a kind that weren't quite given before to Ukraine. But the cost of delay can be observed in Ukrainian territories that Russia still controls. The death pits, the torture chambers, and the empty homes of kidnapped children. Tens of thousands of soldiers on both sides have unnecessarily died. That's perhaps a stretch, but it's perfectly within Tim's rights to say that we're happy so far. Um, 
In nearly 15 months of war, despite Russian nuclear propaganda and Western anxiety, uh, there's been no use of nuclear weapons, which is just a fact. This is an absence worthy of explanation, Tim says. Those who predicted escalation if Ukrainians resisted, if the West supplied weapons or if Russia suffered defeat, have thus, um, f thus far been wrong. I think that's fair, although you could say um, they have thus far not been proven right. That would be equally valid. Um, strategic thinkers point to um, deterrence and note that nuclear use would not in fact bring a Russian victory. It would ensure a dramatic Western response and make Russian leaders pariahs, Tim says. Now, we are here now transitioning a little bit from um, balanced historical judgment into advocacy. We don't know what the Western response would be and what the Western response would be absolutely depends on when that would happen. And as you know, Mr. Putin is very precious about escalating at the right time. For instance, he still plans to challenge Article 5 in the years to come, but he thinks that that challenge could only be effective, right, if it were done at the right time. And for Putin, the right time means decline of Western democracy, um, a, a, a change of political orientation of major Western countries, sort of Viktor Orban type politicians coming to power in the United States or in France, and Putin thinks he might do it. Tim goes on, but there is a deeper explanation. Russia's nuclear talk is itself the weapon. And I think that's absolutely fair. Not only um, has Russian nuclear talk been a weapon, it's been an effective weapon. I think Tim is making both of these claims, and to that extent, I think he is clearly correct. He goes on. It rests on false premises. Russian nuclear propaganda assumes that the bully always wins. But the bully doesn't always win. Russian propagandists want us to think that nuclear powers can never lose wars on the logic that they always deploy nuclear weapons to win. This is an, an, histor an ahistorical fantasy. Nuclear weapons didn't bring the French victory in Algeria nor did they preserve the British Empire. The Soviet Union lost its war in Afghanistan, America lost in Vietnam, and in Iraq, and in Afghanistan. Israel failed to win in Lebanon. Nuclear powers lose wars with some regularity. This is advocacy, this is not um, history. So, so this is an important claim I'm making here. I'm not saying that um, Tim is wrong. That's secondary, right? What I am saying is that um, this is not a mode of an historian expressing judgments about historical events in public. This is instrumentalization of history for a cause, Ukrainian victory. Is this illegal? Not at all. But what is it? It's advocacy. Or it's political propaganda. There's nothing wrong with propaganda. There's always got to be propaganda for a good cause. But this is a challenge because, of course, this is a professional historian engaging in advocacy. Um, arguably, right, and I'm quite sympathetic to, to this generous argument myself, actually, that can coexist. But this raises questions because um, Tim may not be perceived as an advocate, right? We'll say a bit more about that later. Now, these conflicts um, have very little in common with what's happening in Ukraine. Um, some of them were just insurgencies. 
um, and they were not existential conflicts. Um, it is much less obvious, to put it mildly, that this conflict um, for Russia um, is not existential, right? Um, then is the case of, of, about these 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 um, examples of the Soviet Union in Afghanistan, the United States in Vietnam, the United States in Iraq. Um, you could make the case, as generously Sergei Ratchenko on Twitter uh, put, um, who made a comment on Tim's uh, piece, um, you could make the case, even if you'll struggle to make it plausible, this, that this war isn't existential for Russia. Um, but that's a case you'd need to make. And th this attachment of examples is um, a, a kind of a, 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 a song and dance that then um, executes not much more than a sort of an act of sticky taping things together. I don't think Tim makes any advance at all by bringing in these examples. But the key issue here isn't that this is not quite right um, uh, as, it, as a chain um, uh, of um, a case. It's rather that um, this is this is not an act of putting together a kind of a, ch a, a chain of a case and making connections. It's advocacy. Some Americans have proposed. Um, oh, and I, I suppose this is this, this is what one would say in general about the, these examples. Um, nuclear weapons weren't used then, and good. But. Um, it doesn't follow that they couldn't have been, and it certainly doesn't follow that um, uh, nuclear use wasn't considered. I'll leave it up to historians to um, assess that, um, how serious were considerations to use nuclear weapons in Korea or on, on Vietnam. I won't comment on that. Um, but all we can take away from pointing out that they weren't used is that they weren't used and then that's good. Um, some Americans have proposed a nuclear scenario in which Russians will have to use nuclear weapons to head off defeat. But Russia has been defeated in Ukraine on its own terms again and again. That's debatable. What it has proved is its ability to change those terms after each defeat. There were certainly humiliating setbacks. Um, Russia failed to achieve the explicit aim of the special military operation to overthrow Ukraine's democratic government. There uh, will be no greater humiliation than that, Tim says. How about losing Crimea? Um, this sentence is so glaringly part of political propaganda, part of advocacy, um, th that it's worth stopping and just taking it on board. There'll be no greater humiliation than that, right? And what is that? That is the humiliation Russians has already suffered. Um, certainly an historian in the professional capacity could not say that, nor would a public intellectual who isn't an advocate. And we'll make these distinctions a bit more clearly later on. The defeat at Kiev was followed by further defeats in Kharkiv and Kherson. Each loss led to cover stories from Russia's state propagandists and their believers, um, to talk of goodwill gestures, strategic withdrawals, and so on. The escalation has been the propagandist's workload. Russia can lose without being cornered, Tim goes on. It has 11 time zones of space for retreating soldiers and plenty of practice in propaganda refashionings. Indeed, Russian leaders have already indicated um, what they will do if they believe they're losing, change the terms of reference and change the subject in Russian media. Mr. Putin's kleptocratic state as a whole and its dependencies, such as the Wagner mercenary army, a public relations project with a military arm. 
nothing terribly wrong with this other than that it's not quite true. They were that before the war, but then a kind of reformatting of the state happened, whereby now um, this isn't just a state that controls the informational environment for the sake of controlling the informational environment and sustaining power. It's a state now that has an escalatory project. And it's this escalatory project that is making Tim write these articles. Tim goes on, the assumption in Russian politics is that rhetoric overcomes reality. It's not quite any longer the assumption. Um, and the rhetorical preparations for defeat have been made. What the real prepara preparations that have been made are, are preparations for a large-scale war against the West later on in the 2020s. That is what young Russian children are being re-educated for. This is not manipulation of the informational environment. This is manipulation of actual political space, including the political space in which you and I live. Tim goes on. Beneath Mr. Putin's vague bellicosity is the idea that Russia wins if it avoids strategic defeat imposed by NATO. Almost no matter what happens, it'll be easy for him to define the war in Ukraine as a strategic victory. It will not be easy for Mr. Putin to define losing Crimea as a strategic victory. Um, since the Kremlin claims that it is fighting NATO, all Mr. Putin has to say is that Russia stopped NATO from crossing into Russia. The commander of Wagner wrote um, uh, in this spirit recently that Russia can end the special military operation quote unquote at any time and just claim that its goals have been achieved so long as Russia does not retreat any more um, uh, from any more Ukrainian occupied territory. Next paragraph. By taking nuclear blackmail seriously we have actually increased the overall unpredictability of nuclear war. Now, I don't want, be, don't want to be very harsh on that statement. Certainly, it, it is unsayable in a professional academic context um, because obviously nuclear blackmail has to be taken seriously and taking it seriously does not mean yielding to it. Taking it seriously is one thing, reacting to it is another. Um, by taking nuclear blackmail seriously, we've actually increased the overall unpredictability of nuclear war. Tim is saying that it doesn't reduce nuclear risk to kowtow to Mr. Putin's and his regime's nuclear threats. And in some hyperbolic form that that may contain truth. Um, and so whatever this is, this is this is um, not an academically permissible statement. It absolutely doesn't need to be. This is a, a, a New York Times opinion piece. But it's a fascinating question what this is, how far this is um, communication with the general public in terms that strike home, which is the kind of public intellectual work, or how far it is advocacy. And this to me is advocacy. More than, more than public intellectual work, and both are entirely legitimate enterprises. If nuclear blackmail enables a Russian victory, the consequences will be incalculably awful. I'm sympathetic. If any country with nuclear weapons um, can do whatever it likes, then law means nothing. No international order is possible, and catastrophe beckons at every turn. Countries with nuclear weapons will have to build them on the logic that they will need nuclear deterrence in the future. Nuclear proliferation would make nuclear war much more likely in the future. Well, that's a true statement, but there is now a tension here, and it's a product of the kind of piece that this is, we'll say more about this at the end, between saying that Putin won't use nuclear weapons and that we should worry about others using nuclear weapons in the future. 
because that we should worry about others using nuclear weapons in the future implies that states do use nuclear weapons beyond just threatening to use them. Tim goes on, when we understand that nuclear talk is itself a weapon, and this is really very important, I think this is not just true, but um, there is a kind of a prejudice that has that gained common ground, uh, that has gained currency recently, that um, the Russians are done with nuclear blackmail because the United States has threatened them appropriately and China has also said no. This seems to me to be false. It's just the case that when Putin is feeling vulnerable, he escalates nuclear blackmail. When he is feeling stable and solid, he, he de-escalates that rhetoric. Um, when we understand that nuclear talk is itself a weapon, as it absolutely is, we can act the situation to make the situation less risky. The way forward to strategic thinking is to free ourselves from our own anxieties and consider the Russian ones. The Russians talk about nuclear weapons not because they mean to use them, but because they believe a large nuclear arsenal makes them a superpower. Nuclear talk makes them powerful. They see nuclear bullying as their prerogative and believe that others should automatically yield at the first mention of their weapons. The Ukrainians are not allowed, uh, have not allowed this to affect their tactics. So, um, this is a fascinating um, matter of divergence. Let's say that you offer the deal to Ukrainians. Look, you can comprehensively defeat Russia in this war, but you're going to run a 10% risk of global nuclear war. A lot of Ukrainians would take that. Most Ukrainians might take that, but no Westerners would take that. No Western leader could have a 10% nuclear war. So there's a potential of a conflict here. Um, and the question is, what degree of nuclear risk is permissible for us? And my point isn't going to end when it seems like it ends, because there is a huge twist that's coming. But the question is, what degree of elevation of nuclear risk is permissible to get Ukraine potentially to win? Um, if we think that that's what we're doing, which at the moment we're not, um, we're getting Ukraine to survive. But let's say we were trying to get Ukraine to win, what would be the risk that would be permissible for us to run if we assumed, um, as is plausible, that might be in our national interest too, if Ukraine won? Um, here is the twist. And Tim agrees with this, actually. This is important. You, you can't um, avoid this nuclear risk by copping out of the prospect of increasing nuclear risk to help Ukraine win because Putin plans to escalate later, right? Mr. Putin is not going to be stopping unless he is stopped. And so even if we say, okay, we'll allow a frozen conflict to avoid Ukraine taking Crimea, which in my view would absolutely elevate nuclear risk. Ukraine being on the verge of Crimea would elevate nuclear risk. It, this is not answered by the observation that no um, pragmatic military end would be achieved by the, the use of nuclear weapons. This situation would escalate nuclear risk, but here's the problem. If we allow a frozen conflict, Mr. Putin wants to escalate against us in the future. And he's going to try to attack Ukraine again. And he wants to test Article 5. Mr. Putin would elevate nuclear risk later. So trying to uh, reduce nuclear risk now would um, increase it later. Or at least there is no way of getting out of this dilemma um, that um, if we chose to be conservative now, it's not going to follow that um, uh, this conservative solution will work in the medium term. Right? So we're weighing nuclear risk now versus nuclear risk later. We are not weighing nuclear risk now versus nothing at all later. Right? That's what a lot of people misunderstand. Tim gets this. This is important. Worse still, neighbors of Russia would build or build up their nuclear arsenals um, if Russia detonated a nuclear weapon. 
and that would deprive Russia of superpower status in the minds of Russians themselves. Um, and um, that is, for the Russian leadership, the one intolerable outcome of this war. In my view, the greatest risk of a Russian nuclear action would actually come from getting involved with the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, if anything. Tim concludes, war is unpredictable, military history is full of surprises, Mr. Putin has undertaken a war of atrocity, and further atrocities are certain as long as the war continues. Russia has created not only needless suffering, but also needless risk when it's invaded Ukraine. We have to work within that world of risk and horror and evaluate it calmly. No opinion is without hazards, no option is without hazards. And our responsibility is to reduce them. When Russians talk about nuclear war, the safest response is to ensure their very conventional defeat. So a lot of people have jumped on this piece by Tim, and I don't actually think that what, what we've read is particularly bad. Um, it's a piece of advocacy. There's two or three sentences there that don't sustain scrutiny. Um, but um, let's try to break it down a bit. So um, in conclusion, let's talk a little bit about roles right, of experts. Let's talk about flaws a bit. And let's talk about context. So roles first. I've noted down a few um, that when I was thinking about speaking with you. Um, one is the role of an academic, or in this case, an historian. One is just a professional historian. That's one role. Another role is a public historian. That's somebody who is not a public intellectual quite, but narrowly um, is, a, is a, a specialist at speaking to the culture about um, history. Maybe Stephen Kotkin is an example of that, right? I mean, Stephen Kotkin is not necessarily going to speak to us about the widest cultural challenges we face. And that makes him a public historian rather than a public intellectual. The third category after historian, then public historian, then public, there is the, the third category is then public intellectual. So you can be a professional historian, but over and above that you can be a public intellectual. That is somebody who just speaks to all the important social and political challenges we face. Fourth, you can be a pop intellectual or a pop historian or another term with the same thing would be an intellectual entertainer. Um, that sounds demeaning. A lot of marvelous people have been intellectual entertainers, but we have to be honest. They are intellectual entertainers. Um, somebody I, I liked very much was an intellectual entertainer, Christopher Hitchens. Um, no serious expert in modern secularization would think that Christopher Hitchens's arguments against religion are mature or serious um, or even interesting. Um, and that means that they're not serious, they're not even wrong. They just don't touch on issues of dealing with um, uh, the place of religion in the modern world. So he's a brilliant intellectual entertainer. Neil Ferguson veers quite a lot in recent years into intellectual entertainment, even though it's not his only hat. Um, then the next category is advocate or propagandist. Um, and I, I'm happy with advocate, especially in, in the case of somebody like, like Tim Snyder, because Tim has integrity. Um, and even though propagandist doesn't, doesn't have to be an, an, a negative term. It has that ring to some people. So let's say advocate. And then another category is entrepreneur. Somebody who is just riding the, you know, currents of algorithms and audience capture for the sake of self-advancement. And that is it. There's plenty of people doing that grift anytime a major issue arises for and against. There's so many people uh, grifting in, in a pro-Russian way, right? Um, grifting for money, grifting for views, grifting for followers. But there are also people grifting in a pro-Ukraine way. Um, you know, there's one, one... Immediately I'm thinking of one very prominent um, uh, person who, who takes a very, very uh, uh, tough 
um, position on opposing any anything Russian really um, and um, there is the grifter um, so we've got the categories down and it doesn't have to be just about historians, it could be about any other academic, but our first category is just a professional historian in the academy. They might come on the news, they might say something in the papers, but basically that's what they are. They're not, they're not, they're not wearing a hat whereby they are especially sensitive to the nuances of addressing a general audience. Number one. Number two, they're a public historian. Number three, they're a public intellectual. Number four, they're a pop intellectual. Number five, they're an advocate. And number six, they're an entrepreneur. So what I'm saying we have seen there from Tim is advocacy. Um, flaws. Now, of course, grifting is a flaw, right? But there's no question of that with Tim. So if anything Tim is doing is problematic, in what way is it exactly problematic? It's problematic at the level of mixing up roles, if it is problematic at all. I want to be quite soft here. So it is a problem if um, somebody who is a professional historian and an advocate is perceived to be not that, but a professional historian and a public intellectual. Right? Um, now you could debate what the definition of a public intellectual is, and of course there isn't going to be a definition. Um, but um, if you build into your idea of a public intellectual certain types of responsibility to, um, you know, uh, truthful virtues, um, then some of the stuff we've we've read even today, even though this is very mild. Um, would incline me to say this is not public intellectual stuff, this is advocacy, this is instrumentalization, instrumentalization of ideas. Now, of course you can exaggerate, of course you can manipulate as a public intellectual, but you're manipulating to get your audience, if you're a public intellectual, to think more openly, to see more clearly, rather than instrumentalizing um, whatever you have to hand to get the audience to think a particular thing, right? The person who wants you to think a particular thing is an advocate. The person who wants to point you in a certain direction, um, expand your capacity to look and make sense of things is doing a public intellectual work and potentially you need both. Why do you need both? Well, because it may be that we are, in this case, over over worrying about Russian nuclear risk, that's Tim's argument, and as a result we should worry about it less, and Tim is advocating for that, right? So that's his position, that's his view, and this is a legitimate bit of advocacy. So flaws appear when there are cross-purposes. So for example, if a public intellectual like Charles Taylor is speaking, or Michael Ignatieff, I would recommend you to say that if they have said something, is just going to be true, right? If they've said something that is not a, a judgment about what should or shouldn't happen, but if they've said something that is an interpretation, you can assume that it's true. They might prove to be wrong, but tendentiously that's a reasonable starting point, right? In other words, if, if Michael Ignatiev had said that there's a huge eugenics component to how Russians are conscripting soldiers, I'd say assume that's true. If Tim Snyder says something like that, I cannot honestly recommend you to assume that it's true. It needs to be checked. Now, let's look at whether Tim's piece does more harm than good. And it's, he's got zinged for this, and I'm actually going to have a rather positive conclusion. So, um, there is a kind of harm that it might cause at the level of making us blasé about nuclear risk when we shouldn't be. Um, I, I don't think, I don't think it, ha it carries any such harm. I think that major Western powers are extremely conservative about nuclear escalation. Um, the US administration is extremely conservative and serious about nuclear escalation. Um, Therefore, um, 
if he is completely right or even if he is wrong or partly right tim is not doing any damage on that front here so i'm sorry but no this does not harm us um now is there a very minor harm that it could potentially slightly undermine trust in expertise and that way slightly undermine democracy to do what tim is doing um a bit yeah i think that ambiguity in tim's recent recent discourse between um uh in public intellectual work and just advocacy right and the fact that he's just shifting into advocacy but most people don't perceive him to be doing that most of his followers don't perceive him to be doing that i do think that harms democracy a tiny bit and i do think that undermines faith and expertise a tiny bit and so what's the fault if there is one it's a slight fault at the level of um uh categorization and shifting right in between all of these roles and and um uh being in a healthy relation with the roles one plays and so this is the big takeaway for you no, it's not about tim but most people you follow are lost even if they're very famous about what role it is they're playing what it is that they're doing they're lost name virtually anybody right who is a very prominent commenter has written books has won major prizes most people in these positions don't know what they're doing i don't mean that they don't know what they're doing in terms of their expertise i mean they don't know exactly what they're doing in terms of their role right that they, they are very rarely transparent about that and often it, it, it's it's quite it's quite loose and wonky um now do i think that i agree therefore with the people who have zinged on tim overall for this intervention um i don't i don't um because i think it does more good than harm this piece i'm sorry to say that's what i think why does it do more good than harm um because we shouldn't give in to russia's nuclear blackmail whilst being conservative about nuclear escalation I have myself special views about this. Um, I, for instance, think that there's something apocalyptic about the Kremlin regime, that they're more open to World War Three than we are. They're not open to they're more open to it. I've argued that in one of my videos. I'll, I'll stick that one at the end, actually, in case you haven't seen it. Um, but Tim is saying Ukraine's victory is important, and we've got to be clear-headed that there is no way to just get out of nuclear risk. We're going to have to run into it anyway. So, um, you know, um, we should do that now rather than later. And moreover, even that might not be true, Tim is saying, um, because it just doesn't look like uh, the Kremlin will use nuclear um, weapons, even if they are, are catastrophically defeated. Um, so, But there's this there's this. There's intervention where tim is saying we're over worried about this a bit um and we shouldn't indulge russian nuclear blackmail and i think that what, what makes this argument positive it's that it enters an informational environment where we're already very very worried about nuclear blackmail you see most of you aren't in this community right but that doesn't correspond to how your governments think Right, and so again, and this is the one of the procedural takeaways here. Um, you got to understand what role folks are playing, right? You can't just look at arguments. But moreover, um, whether a, a, an argument is good, whether an intervention is good, depends on the wider economy of discourse. So whether what I say is good depends on who else is saying what, right? You know, if we live in the village and there is a volcano here that might erupt, but the eruption doesn't seem terribly likely, right? It's very positive if somebody talks about it um, uh, in the context in which nobody's talking about it, right? But if everybody's talking about it and somebody adds voice 744, um, it, it may be that we're over-exaggerating the risk, right? So 
you got to judge a, an intervention, an advocacy intervention like that from Tim, right? Against a background of what else is going on. And once you judge it against that background, this piece does more harm than good. But this is an advocacy rather than a public intellectual piece. And Tim has now become, in recent months, an advocate and a professional historian. He's still a baby. He's born late 60s, right? So that's going to give him two, three decades of work. He could become a public intellectual and a professional historian. Again, having been an advocate and a, and a professional historian for a period. Um, so never close the door on somebody. And the, clearly we've got somebody here who is um, in no way grifting. Right? And by the way, what, what is grift? Grift is not uh, mixed motives or impurity of motive. Right? Most people are going to have impure motives. Grift is not impurity of motive, but a, a reasonably a clarity of motive of a deleterious kind, right? There's no question that that's happening with Tim. So that's my breakdown, but the key takeaways on Tim, their procedural, uh, lots of love, talk soon.